All right, let's uh, stand together and pray. Let's ask the Lord to speak to each one of us today in your own words. Father God, we thank you for being here with us, among us, in us. And Lord, what a great privilege it is to serve you today. And we just love you, Lord, and we love to hear from you. We love when you talk to us and when you teach us, when you change us. We ask you to do that today, Lord, by the Holy Spirit, to transform us into the image of Jesus. Lord, we pray that your word could reach into our hearts today and speak to us, Lord. Every single one that's here, I pray. Lord, speak to my heart today and reveal to us something of your nature. Lord, we wanna see Jesus afresh. And so we ask you for this good gift, Lord. We ask you for more of the Holy Spirit today. And we thank you that you're a good father who will give good gifts to your children. So bless this time we commit it to you, Lord. I just ask you to use my words and my heart here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you may be seated. Well, do you like everything to be the same every Sunday, or do you like to do things a little different sometimes? Okay, so you're happy today, right? <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to continue in our series on 1 Timothy. We're in chapter 6, and um, the title here is, Are You Serving God or Serving Money? Um, It's a pretty convicting message to me. Uh, when I was preparing this yesterday, I was thinking about it, and you know, it's nice to be able to give messages to people from God that you know are helpful and change lives and things. But if it, if it doesn't affect you, the messenger, something's really amiss, and. Uh, so I was asking the Lord, you know, what do you want me to do about this? Because we need to do something with God's word. And uh, I said, Lord, I don't want to just preach the word to your people. And, you know, as uh, this preacher who's got it all together and you guys need to, you know, do it too and, 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 and so forth. But really, I'm, I'm preaching to myself as much as to anybody uh, I feel my need for this word of God, and I want to be a doer of the word. So I, I have, I've asked the Lord to show me something I can do with what he says through this. And I believe he has given me several thoughts there, and, and uh, I guess the days will, to come will, will show. You know, it's, it's, It should make us tremble when we preach God's word because the Bible says that we are more accountable. We are more, we shall be judged. Uh, it says in James, be not many masters for we shall have the more uh, serious judgment. So that's the, the spirit that I'm coming here today with. I feel like this message really does flow with what God has been doing in our midst the last few weeks and months the desire for more of the Holy Spirit, um, as I see it, I think probably the greatest hindrance that we have as a church uh, in America and as a church here, Charity Christian Fellowship, I think the greatest hindrance we have to spirituality and walking with God is how we deal with finances and money. Jesus went so far as to say they're kind of the, the two things we have to choose from. Uh, he said, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon or money. Our Lord, this is Matthew Henry, a quote from him in his commentary. He said, our Lord does not say we must not or we should not, but we cannot serve God and mammon. We cannot love both. We can't do it, it's, it's impossible. You either love the one or you love the other. You either hold to the one and despise the other or vice versa. And so, it's a very important question. And we wanna look at that here today. What does it mean to serve money? 
What does it mean to serve God? And I think uh, the first Timothy chapter six really gives us some concrete shoe leather, so to speak, of what, what are the answer to those questions? Because I think we would agree those are pretty important questions. If we can't serve both, we, we really wanna know what does it mean to serve God and what does it mean to serve money? So we wanna um, get into our text here. We're in 1 Timothy chapter six. Uh, last time the message we had, we started with the first two verses. We, pretty, we spent a lot of time on these first two verses and so uh, I'm not gonna spend that much time on it today, but um, it says, let as many servants or slaves as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed or in, spoken evil of. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. So we spent like the whole message last time talking about servants and how we live the title that I changed it to finally was uh, Decorating the Gospel at Home and at Work. Our life, lives are supposed to be a decoration of the gospel. They're supposed to be a display of, of the gospel. And so Paul was speaking here to servants or slaves, and we spent a lot of time last time talking about, you know, but one of the first things that comes to mind when we think about slaves, we think of the African slave trade, right? And the slavery as it was in America where they stole people from their homeland, sold them, brought them over here, and then just put them in, to work in these awful conditions. And uh, we pointed out last time that that's not the kind of slavery that this was speaking about. Uh, in the first chapter of 1 Timothy, it actually talks about this, the sinful things that people do, and one of the lists there was men stealers. And there's people who steal men and sell them. And that was one of the uh, things that was condemned in this very book. So, um, if you have questions about all that here today, I refer you back to that first message because I did cover a lot of that in detail. But. Let's take a look here at this. Uh, what are some observations that we can make here? First of all, uh, God acknowledges that there's different levels of wealth and he doesn't condemn it. In this world, there's going to be some people who have this much money and some people who have this much money. And God didn't condemn it or say anything about that here. Um, I think in our American way of thinking, we don't like it when things aren't fair, we don't like it when things are different, but the fact is that's, um, it's the way the earth is. Um, I think if we understood as, and saw things as God did, I think we'd see that everything is fair, but it's not according to our idea of fairness. Uh, life isn't fair. It's not fair that those bond servants, you know, spend their life serving these masters and their masters get the benefit of it. Is that fair? Doesn't seem fair to us. Life isn't fair. But um, our attitude in our circumstances will either glorify God or turn people away from him. Paul spoke to those servants and he said, you know, work with all your might. Honor your masters. Do good to them so that the name of Christ will be lifted up. And, and so that uh, he will not be despised or the, the word of God will not be blasphemed. What would have happened if the Christians, in, in, if Paul would have preached to those slaves, those bond slaves, and there was like 30 million of them in the um, Roman uh, empire there? What if he would have preached a message that said, you guys you know, shouldn't be slaves, you, shouldn't, you don't deserve this, it's not fair, and you guys should you know, fight for your rights. Uh, you don't need to work hard for these people, you're not getting anything out of it. Uh, it would have been, actually would have been a disaster for the, for the kingdom of God, what that would have led to. So, 
Um, let's think about application here. You know, we have different people of different economic circumstances right in this room. Some of us have this much stuff or money and some of us have this much. And um, may not be fair. Um, some of us are bosses in this room, some of us are workers. The, the bosses, you know, every hour that the worker works, the boss profits from. Is that fair? It's just, it's a fact. Every hour, if you're a worker, every hour you work, your boss is profiting from that. He's getting something from your labor. God says, uh, an application for, for, from these scriptures is that you should do that joyfully. You should do that cheerfully, that I get to benefit my boss. Um, so how shall we treat our bosses? And I put workers in there too, because I want to talk a little bit about that, but that's not the subject of the scriptures but here. But how shall we treat our bosses? You know, God says we should do it with honor. And if they're Christians, we should do it with actually with, uh, with joy and with a sense of, they're, part, they're getting the benefit of what I'm doing, so I should be extra kind of joyful that I get to help them out. And that kind of goes against our, our grain, doesn't it? Our American grain. Yes. There's somebody. <laughs> <laughs> it goes against our American grain. It just doesn't seem fair. Well, we could talk about the risks that bosses take, and we could talk about all these things, but... but uh, you know, what God says is that we should, in the circumstances that God has put us, we should be serving him with joy, and as we're gonna go on and read, with contentment and with, um, yeah. So, of course, there's also, we could talk about how we should treat our workers, which isn't the subject of the scriptures here, but I was thinking, you know, there was, uh, I looked it up yesterday, the CEOs, how much the CEO makes of a company and how much the average worker makes. And it was kind of startling. Uh, the biggest one was um, Weight Watchers. The biggest difference was Weight Watchers. The lady who's the CEO makes $33 million a year. And her average worker, and I'm not sure what they do, but they make $6,000. So the, uh, the difference was every dollar a person who works for this company makes, the CEO makes $6,000. Imagine that. Now that's not right, is it? <laughs> and, and you know, there's companies, at Home Depot, it's, it's something in the range of $500 to one. The CEO makes $500 for every $1 an average worker makes. So I guess if you're working at Home Depot, you could say, well, after an hour, there's another 500 in so-and-so's pocket. Um, but, uh, you know, speaking, just thinking about that from a Christian point of view, I, I think that should be a consideration, shouldn't it? Is that really right? Is that really the way things should be, that the, the boss should make 500 times what the average worker makes? That's a whole nother subject. All right. The reason this is important is because the, the verses that follow, I think, a lot of times get taken out of their context, and so we don't get the, the full picture of it. This command to the servants is the context for the next, all these verses that follow tell us how to deal with money. And the, the uh, opposing tension here is kind of my right to happiness, my right to fulfillment, and being content. So let, let's take a look here. Paul says, if any man teaches otherwise, anything otherwise of what I just told you, and let's look at it again. 
Whoops. Oh boy. Sorry. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Then they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they're brethren, but rather do them service because they're faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Sometimes um, the new technology is not as great as just looking at the book. <laughs> okay, so if any man teaches otherwise than what I just told you and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we're actually gonna look later at a scripture where Jesus says p pretty much that very exact thing to somebody. That to be content with what you have. And to the doctrine which is according to godliness, so this doctrine that, what he's saying is the doctrine that's according to godliness. He says he's proud. He knows nothing but he dotes about questions and strifes of words. Whereof come envy, strife, railings, and evil surmisings. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw yourself. In, in the Greek, it literally means supposing that godliness is a means to gain, that Christianity is a means to gain. Have we heard any of that in our country ever? That's the prosperity doctrine, isn't it? That if you serve God, you're gonna be wealthy. You're gonna, you know, he's gonna bless you and you're gonna have everything you need and uh, more. Supposing that gain is godliness, in other words, he's saying the fact that you're not gaining anything because you're a servant is godliness. It, uh, how you react to that is godliness. How you respond to that is godliness. Remember the context we're looking at here. These people suppose that gain is godliness. Hey. You servants should be getting something for what you're doing, you know. You shouldn't be the underdog. You shouldn't be suffering, you know. You shouldn't be whatever. He said, if anybody teaches that, they're supposing that gain is godliness. And he says, from such people, withdraw yourself. Get away from those people. But he says, in the next verse, he says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Do you believe that? But godliness, that's the servant who's the underdog, who's not getting paid a dime, you know, maybe, or they're not getting paid much, and they're serving, they're blessing, they're, they're uh, enabling their, uh, their boss or their master to prosper, and they're content. He says that is great gain. Great gain. Why? Because we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. That's a powerful scripture, isn't it? None of us brought a thing into this world. Not a stitch of clothing. We came in here naked, and when we leave, we're not gonna take a thing with us. It doesn't matter how much you got. Steve Jobs, you know, he was worth all the billions. He didn't take anything more with him than the poorest of the poor in India somewhere in a village. He left it all behind. It is certain we can carry nothing out. And yet, how much do we spend of our labor, our energy, our focus, getting more stuff? Stuff that we can't carry out with us. And so that's, that's really one of the focuses that I'm here today is I wanna, I wanna challenge us, you know. I don't think that we realize what it's like to be us. What it's like to live in America what it's like to 
You know, thankfully, a lot of us have been to other places. We've seen poor people, you know, we've been with the poor and, and so forth. But I don't think we realize the atmosphere that we live in that affects us and moves us and causes us to make decisions. We just do the things that everybody else is doing around us. And that's not gonna cut it. And so I wanna really speak into that today. But it says that godliness with contentment is great gain. Are we content here today? Are you content right now with what you have? Physi you know, economically. Are you content with that or do you need more? These teachers would have encouraged, I guess, the, the servants, you know, to do the opposite of what Paul was saying. He's saying, serve your master, bless them, do good to them, as though you're, and he says in other places, as though you are serving who? Jesus Christ. There's no, there's no higher privilege than that, is there? But godliness with contentment is great gain. Whatever we have in this room, whatever we possess, we're all leaving it behind. Doesn't matter how much or little. Here's the real shocking verse, I think, for, for Americans. Look at this one. And having food and clothing, let us be there with content. How many of you guys have food and clothes? You content? The, the bar's pretty low, isn't it? I mean, the level that God says, it's not that high. If you got clothes on your back and food in your stomach and be content, wow. But how many of us are, really? Now, I'm, I'm asking myself that question. I, these are hard things. These are hard searching words. Having food and clothes. Basically, having what you need right now. Be content with it. Because, you know, it says, they that will be rich, and that's interesting that being rich follows having food and clothes. As if, you know, to want more than food and clothes is, is seeking riches. But those that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Wow. Talk about a scary verse. Wanting to be rich has temptations and snares and it leads us into foolish and hurtful lusts that drown men. You get this picture of people just going under the the depth, you know, drowning in destruction and perdition. Why? Because the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. All this context is following his, his command to the uh, slaves. He, he's, he's backing up what he told the slaves to do and how to act and to be content with, with these, all these words here. I believe that how we um, love money or don't love money has a lot to do with faith. You know, money can take the place of faith, can it? If I got enough stuff, I can believe that I'll be taken care of. If I have nothing, Lord, I need you. So in some ways, it's very uh, against. And Paul says to Timothy, though, but you, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto you are also called and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. Faith is a fight. And one of the things that we fight with in faith, especially in where we live right here in America, is money, things, stuff. 
Probably the most challenging person I've ever read uh, in this matter is uh, John Wesley. He was a preacher in the 1700s from England. He was a single man most of his life and he never had any children. So we do need to consider his statements in light of that. Um, but I read a little research. Somebody said in today's money he would have been worth $50 million or he would have earned in his lifetime because of all his writings, his sermons and different things. Can't really verify that myself. But anyway, he was definitely a very wealthy man. But um, he gave it all away. Literally. Again, he didn't have a family. He didn't have children. So, you know, if you do have a family, you do have children, you have to provide for your own. We read that in the last chapter. But uh, he, he said, it's not how much of my money will I give to God, but how much of God's money will I keep for myself? He said, money never stays with me. It would burn me if it did. I throw it out of my hands as soon as possible, lest it should find its way into my heart. He got, his sister heard that he had sold a book, I think it was, or somehow he'd come onto some, into some money and she had a need and so she tried to contact him to, to get some help and she asked him if he had any extra to help her with and he said, I'm sorry, I gave it away already. That was the way he lived his life. Well, that's, that's pretty challenging, isn't it? I think we need to sometimes get around people who are different than us and, and just to stretch us. I mean, maybe I'm not gonna be John Wesley, but can I get stretched a little bit out of my American mold? That's kind of my heart here today. Uh, I'm not presenting anything here today as this is what I think you need to do. I'm saying, Holy Spirit of God, show each one of us what you want to do here. You know, the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. Not people who say, oh, I have to give it away. You know, I've got to do this or that. No, he loves a cheerful giver. And that's what we want to be. But Wesley, um, he was a pretty amazing man. God used him in mighty ways. Do you, think, do you think it's at all connected? The grace of God that was upon John Wesley to start a movement that changed the world. Do you think there's any connection at all with the fact that he gave everything away all the time when he got it? Or is that just sort of a side thing that, didn't really have to do with that. I think there was. You know, in, in, when Jesus talked about the graces of God, the three things, the three means of grace, remember what they are? Giving, alms, fasting, and prayer. And he was saying, when you do those things, God sees what you do in secret and he rewards you openly. So if that's true, and we know it is, we can believe that a lot of the reward that John Wesley had of being able to serve the Lord was due to his giving. He had these three rules that he, that he made and gave to the Methodists. He said, of the three rules which are laid down, you may find many that observe the first rule, namely, gain all you can. Well, we all like that one, right? You may find a few that observe the second, save all you can. Well, wait a minute, that takes a little sacrifice there. Save all you can? You mean I gotta do without something? I gotta do without this pleasure or this thing I wanted to do, this expensive whatever, vacation or this or that? But how many of you have found, have you found that observe the third rule, give all you can? That was his three rules. Have you reason to believe that 500 of these are to be found among 50,000 Methodists? And yet nothing can be more plain that, that all who observe the first rules without the third will be twofold more the children of hell than they ever were before. Whoa. He says, if you follow my first two rules and you don't do the third one, you're gonna be twofold the, more the child of hell than you were before you even started. Wow. What then what way then, I ask again, can we take that our money may not sink us to the nethermost hell? There's one way and there's no other under heaven. If those who gain all they can 
and save all they can will likewise give all they can. Then the more they gain, the more they will grow in grace and the more treasure they will lay up in heaven. I think that's the thing that I'm been missing or that I've missed in my life, you know, more than, than anything is that realization that, um, I mean, I'm an American. I wanna get my stuff. I wanna have my nice house. I wanna have my things. But there's a, there's a grace that comes from God when we have a relationship with our stuff that's healthy, that's right. You believe it? And that's what he was saying here. They're gonna grow in grace. The more you give, the more you grow in grace, he's saying. It's a different way of thinking. I mean, we don't hear that today, do we? They're not teaching that on the radio, are they? They're teaching if you give more, you're gonna get more. And so it's a great deal. Give $100 to my ministry and you'll get 1000 That's, That's, you know, that's not what Jesus taught, is it? It's not what John Wesley taught. But look what he says about money. I like this. This is more in a, a positive way, all right? He's talking about the warnings of the hell and all that. They did a little bit more of that back then too, didn't they? He said, money is an excellent gift of God, answering the noblest ends. In the hands of his children, it is food for the hungry, drink for the thirsty, raiment for the naked. It gives to the traveler and the stranger where to lay his head. By it, we may supply the place of a husband to the widow and of a father for the fatherless. We may be a defense for the oppressed, a means of health to the sick, of ease to them that are in pain. It may be as eyes to the blind, as feet to the lame, yea, a lifter up from the gates of death. Wow. That's exciting stuff, isn't it? Oh, but I have to give my money to do that, to get that, to be that. Wesley's guidelines. This is what he gave for his own personal guidelines. And uh, this, as I said, is challenging for me. I don't, I don't always do this, you know. But I hope I can look at it a lot more. He said, in spending this money, am I acting like I own it or am I acting like the Lord's trustee? By the way, if there's any visitors here today, you're probably thinking we have some kind of building program going on here or something. And you know, we need, we need more money, so that's why we're preaching. But actually, that, that we do have a building program going on here. We're wanting to build up, every one of you to build up your eternal house. Praise God. And to encourage you to do so with lavish preparation. All right, am I acting like I own it or am I acting like the Lord's trustee? What scripture requires of me to spend this money this way? Can I offer up this purchase as a sacrifice to the Lord? Will God reward me for this expenditure at the resurrection of the just? I mean, he was radical. But no more than Jesus. Let's look at Luke 16. He says, and I say to you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. In other words, use money to make to yourself friends. That when you fail, they, your friends, may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? What's the true riches? What was that? Christ. Christ. Isn't the Holy Spirit the most precious thing on earth? Is there anything of greater value? I don't think so. The Holy Spirit is the most precious thing, if I can say it that way, on this earth. And Jesus talked about this in the parable of the sower. He said, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Jesus said three out of the four people that heard the word, it didn't produce the fruit. And he said one of the things that doesn't produce it is when we hear it, 
and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things enter in and they choke out the word and it becomes unfruitful. Brothers and sisters, I feel like this is one of the things, as we're seeking the filling of the Holy Spirit and to, be, to have more of God's Spirit in our life, I think this, we need to take a look at this. And Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They'll be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful, and they will consider nothing sacred. Wow. That sounds like our time. All right, I want to play, I want to play a little clip from YouTube, Thomas, if you want to get that now. We heard from John Wesley from the 1700s. I want to play a clip from somebody from 19, or from the 2000s. I don't know when this exactly this was made. It must have been made in 2000, at least 2006 because some of the cars on this video had a 2006 thing on it. So I'm guessing maybe it was 08, 2010. It, it's good to be around radical preachers from 1700s, but it's also good to see someone from our day who's actually pretty radical too. I don't know how you feel about uh, Francis Chan. How many, how many of you have heard of him? Okay, y'all, a lot of you have heard of him. Likewise, you know, he's a man that has had a lot of money, you know. He's written books that are bestsellers and uh, had, had a lot of money to deal with. But I, I wonder if we can learn something from him here today. This, this changed my life, I can say that. You know, I think I saw this maybe a year or two ago. And I feel like it actually has changed my life. It's made me think differently about money. And I hope it can be the same here today. So let's go ahead, Thomas. I don't know about you, but I love nice cars. I love the way they look. I love just getting in them, the feel when you get in that seat or the way that they accelerate. I mean, if you could afford any car on this lot, which one would you choose? I'm gonna show you the one I chose. It's the 1996 Subaru. Now some of my friends think I'm crazy because they think, man, you could afford any car on this lot and this is what you bought. To me though, I go, this is the only thing that makes sense because the thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars I would save, I, I think, man, I could build an orphanage in Africa. And to me, I go, okay, what, what's going to make me happier five or ten years from now? Is, is it going to be looking back at all those great drives I took, or will it be looking at these orphans that have been fed, that are eating, and full of life? To me, it's like, man, that just makes me happier. It's not like this sacrificial, oh, look at how much I gave up type of thing. To me, it's just, I want to be happy. And not only that, but I think about heaven and I think, okay, whatever I sacrifice on, on this earth, God says he's going to give me a hundred times as much and that's going to last forever. And so while people say I'm crazy, I'm going, man, who's the crazy one? The one that's thinking and investing and obsessed with something that he can't lose in heaven or the one who, who's going to spend everything and know that he could just have his life end at any second. As you read chapter 8, what this chapter is about, it's, it's the profile of the obsessed. I mean, what does a life look like that is obsessed with heaven, that is obsessed with Jesus Christ? And hopefully as you read this chapter, you resonate with it and go, you know, that's totally me. That's totally who I want to be. that ruin your day? Or make your day? Wow. That's pretty challenging, isn't it? I mean, that's a whole different way of thinking. That goes against the grain, doesn't it? I mean, that's like nonconformity to the things of this world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We love our nonconformity in, in certain areas, but do we, do we love nonconformity in this area? Is that a challenge? And, you know, we may not have appreciated everything about the music and the, the hairdo or whatever, 
Or maybe you did, I don't know. But, but you know what? There's something there that's real, isn't it? There's something there I want to learn from. And so that, that's really challenged me. Um, I guess we need to hook up again there, Thomas, right? Or are we hooked up? We're good, okay. Jesus talked about the deceitfulness of riches. You know, they're deceitful. That was pretty cool. Let's do that one again. They, they fool us. And I want, to, I want to give you an illustration of how that works. This is an article from the CNN business from about nine years ago. And this lady writes, decades ago, experts predicted we would all be working just 14 to 15 hours a week by now and would have so much free time we wouldn't even know what to do with ourselves. Instead, U.S. workers have been stuck with the official 40-hour work week, or even longer for many of us, since 1938 in order to finance our ever-expensive lifestyles. The predictions. Back in 1930, the renowned economist John Maynard Keynes predicted technological advancements would mean we would all eventually work just 15 hours a week. That same year, evolutionary biologist Julian Huxley predicted a two-day work week. More recently, a 1965 Senate subcommittee predicted we'd be working 14 hours a week by the year 2000. That was a U.S. Senate subcommittee. These people met together and they said, this, you know, we think that this is what's going to happen. By the year 2000, we'll be working 14 hours a week with at least seven weeks of vacation time. The reality, these great thinkers were right about one thing. Technological progress has made workers more productive than ever before. Yet, rather than cutting the work week gradually over time, like the Europeans did, they still work too much probably, Productivity gains have fueled a consumerism boom in the United States. And so instead of taking time off, Americans are just buying more stuff. And I got to thinking about it. The size of, of homes in America. Because I knew that it's changed over the years, so I did a little research yesterday. And I want to show you, show you how it's changed. Where, where has some of that money gone? Why is it that we still are working 40, 50, 60 hours a week? just to make ends meet? Well, uh, Grandma, my mother-in-law, you were born in 1924, right? That's what I thought. The average house in 1924, the new house built, the average was 900 square feet. That meant each person had 200 square feet of space in their house, 1924. Now, let's fast forward to my birthday. 1961, the average home bloomed up to 1,300 square feet, which was now a whopping 382 square feet per person when I was born. My first daughter was born in 1991. Now the average house built is 2,000 square feet, which is 789 feet per person. And now my granddaughter, I hope I got this one right, 2017? Joy? I think so. Uh, now it's 2,600 square feet and each person gets 1,000 square feet per person in the homes that built today. Now, you know as well as I do that every one of those 1,000 square feet cry out for something to be filling them up, don't they? Like how many of you just have rooms that are empty? You do? Well, good for you. <laughs> I don't. Every one of those rooms in our house cries out for something to put in it. And I mean, in America, there's just so much stuff that people just throw out. And I mean, there it is sitting beside the road even. You know, I could make some use of that. And I, I do that. And so... We have all this square feet. People back in 1924, they got by, somehow they managed on 200 square feet a person. I'm not sure how they made it. I mean, that must have been awful. But today, we gotta have 1,000 feet per person. And I work in a lot of houses, you know, and, 
And it does amaze me, you know, you, you work in this huge place, it's sprawling, it's beautiful, all these nice rooms, and they, they use like one room downstairs, you know, or two maybe. And, you know, one room upstairs. And, but they're paying, we're paying for all those rooms. Guess what? You got to heat them. You got to, you know, I guess you don't have to, but most people do. AC. They require paint, they require maintenance, they require taxes, they require all this stuff. And that's not all. Wait a minute. There's 1.9 billion square feet of self-storage space in the U.S. Aptly named, I might add. That's 5.4 square feet per person. A thousand feet just wasn't quite enough. I need five more feet. 5.4 more feet. Now I know not everybody has a storage shed. It actually works out to 54 feet because only one in 10 people use the things. But anyway. I'm not trying to put a guilt trip on us for our stuff here today at all but I do want to rattle our, rattle our cage and make us think about things. Someone made a book, uh, Material World. Anybody ever read that or looked at it? It's a pretty interesting book. What they did is they got all these people from different countries in the world to stand outside their house with all their stuff around them. So this, this is a guy from Bhutan I mean, doesn't, doesn't it just move you to look at his face? Wow, Lord. He's a, he's a witch doctor, actually, they said in the description. They didn't call him that, but that's all his stuff. Here's one from Mongolia. Now, there's what? One, two, three, four, five, six people. Boy, they didn't even get their 200 square feet. They look pretty happy too, don't they? Here's one from uh, South Africa. Now that's a 400 square foot home right there. That's all their stuff. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people. Eight goes into 400. They each got 50. Oh, here we are in America now. I think he's from Texas. We'll do one from California. That looks more like my stuff. I mean, I do, I have a lot of stuff, I know it. I, have, I do have 13 people in my house, so. Here's a little gift from Elizabeth from Sacramento. I asked her if she could draw me a picture last night. It kind of looks like a Sacramento house, too. You cannot serve God and money. So many in our nation, and I dare to say there may be some of us, we are servants. We're servants to the lifestyle we've chosen. We're servants to the American dream that we've bought into. And so every day we go off and slave. And so many times we don't even question what we do. We never question it. We just look around at everybody around us and this is how you do it. Everybody does it this way. We never stop and say, you know what, does God have a different way for me? I've tried to do that. Go back to Jesus' words. One of the company said to him, Master, speak to my brother that he would divide the inheritance with me. Here we go right back to this uh, idea that we looked at in the First Timothy chapter 6. This idea that something's unfair here, and Jesus, I want you to make it fair. Make him give his inheritance to me. You know, make the master give me more of what he has. 
And Jesus just said to him, no, he said, I'm not even going to go there. He said, man, who made me a judge or divider over you? And then he said, take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And then he told a story. The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully and he thought within himself saying, what shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, this I'll do, I'll find those who don't have enough and I'll share my blessings with them. Is that what your version says? He said, this I'll do. I'll pull down my barns and I'm gonna build bigger ones. And there I'll bestow all my fruits and my goods and I'll say to my soul, soul, you have much goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then who shall those things be which you have provided? So is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And he said to his disciples, therefore I say unto you, and we're gonna look at this passage here a little bit. It's a little lengthy, but let's, it's the word of God. It's Jesus' words. I say to you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for your body, what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. How much more are you better than the fowls? And which of you with taking thought can add to his stature one cubit if you then be not able to do that thing which is least why do you take thought for the rest consider the lilies how they grow they toil not they spin not and yet i say unto you that solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these if then god so clothes the grass which is in the today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven how much more will he clothe you O ye of little faith and seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be of a doubtful mind. For after all these things do the nations of the world seek, and your Father knows that you have needed these things. But rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. And now look what he says. Fear not, little flock. Isn't that, doesn't that speak into the very need when we start thinking about this kind of thing? We're afraid. He said, don't be afraid. Why? First of all, you're a flock, you have a shepherd. Secondly, you have a father who cares for you. And third, he's the king. It's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourself bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approaches, neither moth corrupts. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So I want to look at why serving money is appealing. First of all, the reward is immediate and tangible with money. You know, I can feel it, I can hold it, I can taste it, I can do something with it now. With God, it's not quite that way. We, we can't just manipulate God and, and just get everything now. It gives me the illusion that I'm in control. It's affirmed by almost everybody I meet. You know, if you're, if you're doing well financially, if you're rich, almost everybody you meet is gonna affirm you. They're gonna bless you. They're gonna say, whoa, man, th there's a guy who's got something, you know. You'll be affirmed by almost everybody you, that you meet. And it feeds your ego, my ego. It feels good. So the questions we wanna look at here today, do you serve God or money? What does my lifestyle and bank account reveal about my priorities? You know, it's, it's, it's not that complicated. If you come and look at my checking account, you can tell where I spend my money. What does my lifestyle and bank account reveal about what's the most important thing in my life? That's a really good question to ask ourselves today. Maybe I need to go home and take another look at it.
do I ignore the needs of the poor? The thing that troubles me is that, you know, today there's so much on YouTube and on news and whatnot. I mean, like I don't have beggars really at my door, but they're, they're not very far away, are they? The needs of the world, the, the, I don't know how to deal with that except for just give it to God and ask him what he wants me to do about it. But am I doing anything about it? Do, am I doing a thing for the poor? You know, that's one of the things that struck me so heavily about John Wesley's uh, teachings and his just preaching. That was such a huge thing to him. Like that was a central thing that he talked about over and over and over, was giving to the poor. We just don't even talk about it nowadays. We don't, it's not a part of our sermon, you know, and uh, until today anyway. But uh, it's something I think we need to look at more. Here's a good one. Am I joyfully generous? We already read that God loves a cheerful giver. You know what? I hope nobody goes out of here and you're just weighed down with this weight that Brother Paul, you know, put all this stuff on me and told me about how big my house is and, you know, and so I'm, I, I better, I have to do something. You know, I gotta give a little here or there. I hope nobody does that. If you, if you can't give cheerfully, don't give. I mean, bottom line. I hope all of us go out of here and do something cheerfully what we can, what we feel the faith to do, and, and to give of what God has blessed us with. So I, I really love that. I got this somewhere, I, didn't, I don't have the reference for where I got some of these questions, but I thought they were really good. Am I joyfully generous? Do I work for earthly treasure or heavenly treasure? Why am I going to work every day? And I'm not against work, and I hope that doesn't come across that I'm advocating that you know, we should all try to work just 20 hours a week. Um, However, I do feel like, what if we would, what if all of God's people who would, would work less hours at their job, make enough that they can live on and serve the Lord in those other hours? Do you think that'd be pleasing to the Lord? I do. I mean, that is how I live. What is the decisive factor in the choices of life that I make? What is the bottom line? When I go to buy a house, for example, what is the decisive factor? Lord, the, the God, I need this place and it's gonna serve my family and it's gonna help me to serve you. Is that the decisive factor or is there some other factor that's ahead of that? I think that, that's the question we have to ask. I think so many of us, we, we look at the world around us, we see all the choices that people are making and we go, okay, that's how you do it. So we make those choices and then we go, when it comes time to serve the Lord in different ways, we go, well, I'd love to do that. I, I just can't though, I can't make ends meet. I have to work so much because, you know, I've got to make ends meet. Well, who gave you the ends to meet? Was it God or was it society, culture? That's the real question. I hope some of us can get radical here. Especially young people, you know, but all, not all of us. What could God do with us if we would be different than the culture around us? If we would take a good look back at the way money is spent, the kind of cars and houses and things that we get, and we would put that all through the filter of what is God's will for my life? How can I serve him? How can I glorify him? How can I have the, the treasure that he's given me? How can I best use it? Wow. You know, we could, change, we could change the world, couldn't we? But the sad thing is that so many Christians in America, we're so caught up in this standard of living that we feel we have to have. And so, instead of the 15 hours a week that was predicted. And I think it's actually probably accurate. 15 or 20 hours a week, I think probably a lot of people could live on that if we made our choice, if we lived in that 1,000 square foot house. But no, we've gotta have the 2,600. That actually is what my house is, 2,600 feet. Of course, 13 people is in 2,600. That's only 200 feet, so I'm still good, right? I'm still back in 1924. <laughs> but 
But they're leaving now, so we'll have to see what to do about that. So what is the decisive factor? And if in your life today there's, there's factors that you have surrounded in yourself with, with the, the bills you have to pay, that a super expensive car or house that you just got to pay for, would you consider, would you lay that before God and ask him what he wants you to do about it? And I just want to close with this thought, which I mentioned already, but is the Holy Spirit the most valuable thing on earth to me? I hate to even say thing for a Holy Spirit, but since we're talking a lot about things, you know, the Holy Spirit, is that what I want more than anything? I think we do, really. I think we'd agree that he is the most valuable, wouldn't we? I mean, he is life. If you leave earth without the Holy Spirit, you die. If you leave life with the Holy Spirit, you just keep on living forever and ever and ever. And so, um, let's go ahead and turn that off then, Thomas, if you would. So I'd like us to think about, you know, the life that I, I've talked about here today really is, is the life of Jesus, isn't it? Isn't that how he lived? He lived for the Father's will. He wasn't consumed with stuff. The stuff that he had was stuff to be used to, to help others. He didn't hoard. Our nation and our culture tells us you've gotta have this X amount for retirement and all this. That's not what Jesus told us, is it? I mean, I'm, I'm getting up to that age, right? And uh, may not look that old, but 61. What is God's will for that? We get the chance to partake of the life of Jesus. That's what, that's what we want. And how we do use our money, our money, the things that God entrusts to us, is a big part of that. We just bow our heads here today. Lord, I know this message has been a, a difficult one and a challenging one. And, uh, but Lord, it's your words, not mine. It's your will for us. I pray, God, that you would personally flesh this out in my life and in each life here that every single one of us, Lord, would be a living sacrifice and lay our stuff before you. Everything we have, you gave us, God. I pray you'll bless the further service here. In Jesus' name. We are planning a, a worship service here and uh, I wasn't sure if we should do this message before or after or whatever. I talked to Tim. We were kind of a little back and forth on it. But, you know, I got to thinking about it. The first time worship is mentioned in the Bible, that was the time when Abraham took his son up to the Moriah. It's the very first mention of worship. Abraham said, we're going up there to worship. And what he was saying by that is, I'm going up there to take the most precious thing I have in my life and I'm gonna offer it to God. And so I think it is a, it is a fitting time as we, as we are now transitioning into a time of worship that um, it's, it's fitting. That is true worship. It's a life that's on the altar of sacrifice to where God can do and say anything he wants to me and use me any way he wants to use me. Amen? May God bless further service here.